Here's what's coming up on episode 92 of the Big Seance Podcast. Troy Taylor. Um, go into a group of ghost hunters, you know, anyone, say, you know, 35 and under, and ask them who Harry Price was. I can guarantee you that 80% of them would have no idea who he was. But then ask them what they do when they go to a ghost hunt or during an investigation, and I can get out one of Harry Price's books and go tick, tick, tick down the list. They're still doing it. Famous writers, actors, you know, who sat and watched these things happen and said, hey, I saw it. I saw it happen. I'm swearing to it. Here's an affidavit that I filed that said, I saw this man levitate out the window. I was just going to say he was the one that floated he, he out the freaking window. flew out window. the window and then <laughs> flew in another window. If not for spiritualism, we women would not probably have seen the vote as early as 1920. It probably would have taken even longer. But spiritualism was the first real movement that put women into positions of leadership. They would be locked up inside this cabinet, tied up, and as soon as the doors would close, musical instruments inside the cabinet would start flying around and playing. Uh, the guitars would play, tambourines would shake, bells would ring, hands like that were allegedly spirit hands. You know, I am sitting here acting this out, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> As I'm talking to you, I'm waving it's my hands around. It's too bad we're like, not a oh video show. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Troy Taylor is one of the biggest paranerds I know. He just wrote an amazing book that looks perfect on the shelf right here in the parlor. And so I obviously wanted to talk to him about that. But he's also, once again, organizing the annual Haunted America Conference, which is really only a month away. So it's the perfect time to talk about the book and see what I can expect when I get to the conference. So have a seat. and Let's get started. Troy Taylor is a researcher of history, crime, and the supernatural, and the author of at least 120 books on ghosts, hauntings, history, crime, and the unexplained in America. He is also the founder and owner of American Hauntings Tours and Events. He's also a public speaker. In 1993, he founded his own publishing company for books about the supernatural. And you've probably visited his website, prairieghosts.com. This is Troy's second appearance on the Big Seance Podcast. The last time was just about a year ago. It was uh, episode number 59. There are two reasons that I'm having, well, three reasons that I'm having him back on. One, he's just super cool. But also because this summer he is hosting the 21st annual Haunted America Conference, which is America's original ghost conference. He's the founder and owner of that event, and it'll once again be in Alton, Illinois, this summer on June 23rd and June 24th, 2017. You probably remember I attended and uh, covered the conference for the first time last year, and I had a blast. It was so cool. The other reason I wanted to talk to Troy is because he just recently released a book appropriately titled American Hauntings, The Rise of the Spirit World and the Birth of the Modern Ghost Hunter. And if that's not perfect for the big seance parlor, I don't know what it is. Hey, Troy. Hey, how are you? I'm great. Welcome. 
Thanks. I can't believe it's been a year. I guess I talk to you more often than that, so I don't think about it, that it's been that long since I've been on the show. So I've seen you since then. I've talked to you since then, and I, I time flew by, I guess. Yeah, I've met you twice since then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, our new favorite opening question, probably since the last time you were here, is now um, what can I offer you to drink since we're here in my lovely parlor? Well, since the weather is warm, it's 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 I'm moved on to iced tea now. So oh, okay. Uh, so I'm not doing hot tea until it gets cold again. So. Okay. And and ha- <laughs> so how do you take your iced tea? Um, like the Southern Table wine. Nice. <laughs> that's that's how I grew up with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's just all you get if you order tea down south. That's what you get. So. Yeah. And at, on the dinner table, there was always a giant, like you know, two quart pitcher just right yep. in the center. That's right. Of the table. I haven't really uh, announced it, (laughs) made an official announcement on the Big (laughs) Seance podcast, but I've recently given up sugar and Splenda. Whoa. And, uh, or any artificial sweetener. And that's big for me. I am kind of Splenda obsessed. Oh, really? And so I've been having to deal with my tea and coffee now with honey, which I'm learning to adjust to, but... You know, I'm emptying out a, like half of a bear of honey in a coffee to, oh, yeah. I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> to equal that sweetness of Splenda. Uh-huh. So that's what I have in my coffee today. So the last time I saw you was at your fall festival in Jacksonville, Illinois. And I have to tell you, we had never really just taken a road trip that far into Illinois and it was really beautiful, and I enjoyed it. There there were so many historic little river towns, and uh-huh. uh, and we'd never been to Jacksonville either. It was it was beautiful, a beautiful place with this history that I didn't know about. So can we start by you just telling a little bit about Jacksonville? Because that was a cool place. It's where you had your fall festival. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's my landing place here. Yeah. it. Um, I, I really like Jacksonville. Um, I mean, I've lived in a lot of places over the years. And um, and as you know, I love how much I love Alton. And Jacksonville was sort of the uh, for me, it's kind of the next best thing. We don't have the river here, but we do have this this old historic town, with lots of ghost stories. And uh, I mean, Jacksonville, I mean, started off as just kind of a farm town and really probably would not have amounted to, you know, it would be just another anonymous town. But um, in the 1820s, these these guys rolled in from New England with the idea of civilizing the region. Um, We're going to bring culture and civilization to the West. And they built Illinois College and started the college here. And, you know, at the time, it was one of the, mo- the most famous colleges in the entire country. Um, if you look at some of the old atlases from the 1840s, they'll have Illinois College on it uh, just because it was such a big deal. And a lot of these guys were, you know, ministers and thinkers and things from New England were related to, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And, you know, Edward Beecher was one of the main guys who started the school. So it was a it really put Jacksonville on the map and the town really grew. I mean, we have another college here now. Um, it, it opened uh, as, a, as a female seminary in the 1850s, and it's now McMurray College. And so we've got two – we're, you know, we're a town of 20,000 people with two major private colleges, and I think that's really added to a lot of things. Um, we've got had a great downtown. A lot of it has survived. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of old downtowns don't make it through the fires. Everybody <laughs> – Everybody had a fire at one time or another that wiped out most of their downtown. And, you know, there have been fires here, but they, you know, somehow a lot of the buildings have survived. And so we, I guess I just saw in the newspaper we were named as some kind of um, the only town in Illinois that made some kind of list of, you know, most charming downtowns. I mean, it's a bit of an obscure list, but still, you know, uh, it's it reminded the town square reminded me very much of Back to the Future, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it is. It's got that kind of feel to it with yeah. the Central Park in the middle. And we've got the Civil War statue in the middle of the square and that kind of thing. And, you know, there's a lot of cool you know stores that have come up around the square. And just, you know, we're our little stores just off the square, but it's all still in the downtown. And it's it's just fun. It's a it's a cool little town. And uh, the history's great. The ghost stories are great. Uh, I'm glad you guys got a chance to come up and see it. Yeah, it was very cool. And it was, you know, fall and the leaves and the colors. It was yeah, it was yeah. the perfect time. So and I know it's probably early to ask you this, but 
do you you don't have the fall festival there every year do you do you know where that's going to be no, I don't know. We we haven't really decided. We're considering skipping the fall festival this year just because, you know, when we started doing it like 15 years ago, there wasn't so much going on. Now it seems like in the fall, and I'm not even talking about ghost related events. I mean, obviously there are, you get into October, but it seems like every weekend in the fall is so jammed with you know, festivals and flea markets and, you know, you name it, that we're, we're really considering just keeping, you know, we've got our summer event, obviously, with the conference and then keeping our dead of winter event. And that's, we usually, we've been doing that since, gosh, uh, late 90s, you know, and um, we've got some ideas on that one yet. And if, if it works out the way that we're thinking, it's going to be a really good one. <laughs> it's it's going to be a good one good. So for winter this year. I look forward to that. I haven't attended yeah. one of those yet. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. So the book, dude, it's almost <laughs> 400 pages. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it, it, it just kept growing. Um, it was hard to know where to stop. Believe it or not, I actually trimmed some things out. Because really? <laughs> it just got out of hand. How long did it take to write? Uh, you know, I worked on it off and on a good part of last year. And for me, that's a long time. Uh, normally, I, I usually have several projects going at the same time. So, and I actually did have another project or two going on while this one was going on. So that did make a difference. But in, in all honesty, this book was, and I, and I mentioned this in one of the later chapters, the reason this book exists, well, there, there are several reasons. One reason is because I felt like that not enough people understand how all this stuff got started, why we do, why, why you have a show because of the popular culture that was created by the paranormal in the United States. I mean, this was the country, we invented this stuff. I mean, yes, England is much older and there are plenty of ghost stories, but it was here that people started to to turn it into entertainment, so to speak. I mean, uh, because let's be honest, I mean, the Fox sisters, you know, real or not real, when they started all this in the 1840s, whether they were genuine or whether they were perpetrating a, a you know an elaborate hoax of some sort, they made this into entertainment. That's when it began. They, they drew crowds because people wanted to be thrilled by it. And, you know, it's still going on today. That's why we have the television shows and that's why we have all of the different things. And, and people just, you know, you run into these brick walls of people who think that ghost hunting got started, you know, in 2003 when ghost hunters went on the air, you know, or uh, so it was a lot of that of people not understanding just how far back this goes and how it all got started. And, you know, you talk to all the different people who, who see the popular culture of the supernatural now and assume this is it. I mean, this is where it all got its, its start. And um, I guess the other thing was the, the, the main reason is, is last summer we went to and you already know how I feel about this. So and, and some of your listeners might as well. But we went to the theater to see The Conjuring 2. Mm -hmm. And I have never been as infuriated about a movie and it's it's just a damn movie but still I was so angry because of the way that it was presented because people would th would take it seriously and believe because it said you know oh this was a true story they would believe what was in that movie and it, it you know it didn't give proper credit you and I talked about this we and did yeah it, it it didn't give proper credit to the people who really investigated the case because the warrants had absolutely nothing to do with it you, you can't stop by for an hour and go, oh, yes, I've thoroughly investigated this, and here's a whole movie about it. You know, I mean, the whole thing was obviously made up. I don't know if Ed was really that great of a handyman, but apparently he was, according to the movie. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and all this stuff, and it's like, I can't. I, I sat there, and I just thought, I left that theater, and I thought, this is so irritating. And I said, somehow I'm going to do something, if not for myself, so I can at least vent onto paper as to why this drives me crazy. And, you know, it, it was like, and, and, and the whole conjuring two thing is, is, is like the, the tiny thread that unraveled the entire blanket of their career. You know, um, I, I make a point to say in the book that, that anyone who knew them personally always said they were very kind, very nice people. And I'm sure they are, but you can't refer to people doing the things they do as actual investigators. You just can't. Um, because there's just too many holes. There's just too many problems. I used Amityville as sort of the centerpiece of that. And I, and I'm actually going to be speaking about that at the conference. I I've talked about it a little in the past, but my, my whole presentation is going to be on 
Amityville and the things that surrounded Amityville that exposed the whole thing as a hoax because I'm not a debunker. I mean, you 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 know me well enough to know that that you know I'm I'm definitely a believer in all these things. But when stuff like that comes along, and it paints the whole field in a bad way, that's that stuff has to be pointed out because otherwise, how do you take any of the rest of it seriously? And I tried to do the same thing with this book. Um, there there are entire chapters of you know the people who made this stuff famous, but yet were obviously ter- you know. Were, were hoaxes. I mean, they were, debu- you know, they were debunked. The things they did were debunked. Whether people want to believe it or not, um, a lot of the things that happened in the past that have become famous were not legitimate. On the other hand, there are people that 130, 140 years later, we can't explain how they did the things they did. People have tried to imitate things that, that Daniel Hume did and can't do it. I mean, this was a guy who was conducting seances in well-lit rooms. Not in the dark, not you know, hiding behind a curtain. He would sit in a chair in front of everybody and do things that that no one to this day has been able to explain, other than oh, you can write it off and say oh, it was a mass hallucination. He didn't really levitate, you know. Okay, but here were forty people who saw it, who were you know peers of the British Crown, you know, famous writers, actors, you know, who sat and watched these things happen and said, hey, I saw it. I saw it happen. I'm swearing to it. Here's an affidavit that I filed that said I saw this man levitate out the window. I was just going to say he was the one that floated he, he out the freaking window. flew out window. the window and then <laughs> flew in another window. And, you know, years later, you know, 50 years later, Harry Houdini, who, again, I, I have great admiration for, but, you know, he often erred on in the other direction. But Houdini said, oh, I'm going to I'll show you how he did it. I'm going to imitate it and never did. In fact, no one ever has. Um, his assistant refused to go along with his plans because he said it was suicide. There's no way that he could imitate what Hume had done. So, you know, I, I definitely not, I didn't write this book to say, oh, I don't believe in any of these things. I just wanted to point out that because these things existed, we have what we have today. And, and I, and I, I tried to make it as entertaining as possible because I have watched people's eyes glaze over when I start talking about spiritualists and mediums and seances and all that's old stuff. No, you don't understand. These people were as uh, crazier than the TV celebrities that we have today. Some of the stuff they did back then and the scandals and the the sex scandals and things. And now we look at it and go, oh, well, I guess they weren't as boring as everybody thinks the Victorians were, you know? Um, So I don't know. It was just, it was a book I have really, really wanted to write and I've dabbled in it in the past, but uh, this is really like the full volume. I, I tried to and, and tried to bring it up into the more modern era, things that I don't normally write about. And but I felt like they needed to be in this book because it explained it all, you know. Well, y- you can definitely hear the passion in your voice just hearing you talk about it now. That's what I love about it. You can clearly talk about it for days. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um it's just I don't know. There are there are so many there are so many cool stories that people aren't familiar with, and I think that was trying what I was trying to do. And then, you know, trying to get up into, I had I had I did an interview recently with a guy who's who's writing a book of a similar vein, uh, but he wanted to start his book at the turn of the of the twentieth century and bring it up until today. Um, I sort of ended this book in the nineties and into the two thousands. I started it. I ended it with the beginning of the television shows because. I couldn't tell that whole story because we're still right in the middle. Yeah. Of it. You, you can't look at this stuff as history. Not yet. Someday we'll be able to go back and write about the, you know, the misadventures of, of television. But, you know, I did try to do the same thing I had done with the 1840s. You know, this is how, this is how it got started. This is the reason why it's so popular because, you know, this stuff died out for a while. Um, we didn't really, we, we went through a period of, I don't know, 10 or 12, 13 years when there really wasn't much interest in the paranormal. Um, it really wasn't until, you know, the X-Files came on the air and sightings and shows like that. Suddenly people started to get interested in it. And and that's one of the other things that I've tried to do with the book is show how America's general popular culture has influenced our paranormal one. Um, because in the 60s and the 70s, you know, people weren't really that interested in ghosts. It was all about, you know, exorcists and demons and Satanism and the occult, you know, and it wasn't the ghosts were sort of a, a you know, the, the 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 weird stepchild 
of all of these other things. And then it all turns around again. And, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, the X-Files and really, more importantly, the Internet in the mid 90s, I, I don't think we'd be where we are today. But the Internet came along and all of the ghost people came out again, you know, because here we had a chance to actually communicate with someone outside of our town or outside of our area about our interest in something that the general public really at that time had little interest in. And it just snowballed, you know, and um, I, I blame the Internet on lots of things like orbs. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for that, we we wouldn't. Well, you and I wouldn't be sitting here talking today because if it wasn't for the Internet. I probably would have never, ever published a book other than, you know, one about my hometown. And that, you know, and that would be the end of it, you know. Uh, but you have this audience that you can reach thanks to the Internet and thanks to, you know, the the popularity of, of all of the stuff swinging back in a new direction well that was that kind of leads to a question i wanted to ask you before the internet and before tv and radio and telephones how did because spiritualism exploded yeah how exactly did it spread so quickly so fast and become an era you know the spiritualism yeah, era sure. how did that happen before all these easy lines of communication well you know it started off and and it started off with word of mouth really um and we're talking about upper new york state i mean that's that's where it was that and that was something that needed some explanation in the book i had to kind of go back and explain how bizarre this part of the country was at the time how many uh, you know spiritualists not even spiritual but more spiritual movements and religious movements and cults and crazy behavior was spawned out of upper New York. I mean, it, it, and no one knows why just this area just took root. I mean, that's where the, the, the Mormons came from. There were, you know, all kinds of different groups that just spawned and spiritualism just sort of rode that wave. And it was kind of the tail end of the wave. And so word of mouth spread it through New York and then it made the newspapers. And back then, you know, every town had five or six newspapers. It didn't matter how small your town was. You had several newspapers. And that was sort of the internet and the radio of the day. That was new. It was newspapers and, and broadsides. People would print these cheap little booklets about the things they saw at a seance. And it hit at just the right time in American history. It was, it was sort of in that, uh, that, that era at the end of the 1840s, you know, we, we, we had gone through a couple of wars People were starting to sort of find themselves. Technology was changing. Um, you know, it wasn't long before the telegraph came along. And so things were, were in the middle of a change. And we were on our way to a civil war, which, of course, no one knew that at the time. But with all of the newspapers and the stories, people were looking for something new to believe in. Most organized religion had kind of fallen into a rut at that time, which I think is the reason why we saw all of these these sects and these cults starting to grow in popularity. And people wanted something new. And here it was. Suddenly, you know, suddenly here was something that you, you could actually talk to dead people. This was not something that people had really given much thought about, you know, outside of the Bible. No one talked about this kind of thing. Well, it caught on and it became popular. But, you know, it would have died if not for the, the Civil War. I mean, it was a fad. It was a fad like, you know, fads are much shorter now than they were back then, because back then it took a lot longer for a fad to spread. But through the 1850s, spiritualism was just a fad. Seances were going on. There was nothing really that spectacular about them. You know, they were still knocking on things. And, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, you weren't getting the kind of manifestations that we think of later from seances. That, that came after the war. But because of the Civil War, and as it would happen again after World War I into the teens and the 1920s, you suddenly had massive wholesale slaughter of a kind that no one had ever seen in the history of the world. You know, hundreds of thousands of, of people wounded and tens of thousands of people died. I mean, every family, every town was affected by the war because – you're talking about an event that saw the deaths of, of more people than we'd ever seen in our country, and we weren't really fighting. It wasn't a foreign enemy. It wasn't like fighting the British. We we're fighting each other. So you, if you, you just because you lived in Illinois didn't mean you didn't have family who lived in Tennessee. And so you had death on both sides of your family. 
loved ones, brothers, uncles, you know, civilians died, children died. And suddenly this idea of, well, you know, they're gone, but hey, I, I can still talk to them. I'll just go find the local medium and we'll have a seance. That became huge. And it was, it was I, it, I think one of the chapters of the book I titled How Abraham Lincoln Saved Spiritualism, um, because the popularity of spiritualism was spreading. But what really spread was the news coming out of the White House that, that President and Mrs. Lincoln were trying to communicate with their dead son. And Mary was obsessed. Now, a lot of historians will, will say, oh, no, we don't know that. Well, they're just ignoring the fact that Abraham Lincoln himself said he was involved and attended seances and all the people who met and saw him there, including some of his generals. I mean, these were, these were guys who you know, were personal friends with the president and were at seances that he attended. Um, so people read about these things. They heard about these things. And so now you've got a, a, a celebrity figure of the day. Someone might shoot me for comparing Abraham Lincoln to the Kardashians, but he was a <laughs> he was a beloved figure of the day for a lot of the country. And if it was good enough for Abraham Lincoln, then it's good enough for me. And if the president's going to seances, well, then I should too. And people did it. And that's how spiritualism survived and actually grew into the last half of the 19th century and became as popular as it did. But it was to, to go back to the question without radio or internet or anything, it was all in print. It was all print. And, and they were everywhere. That's the other thing people don't realize is that spiritualists, real or imagined, or just plain, you know, frauds, they were everywhere at the time because it was an easy way to make a buck. And one of the other things that I cover pretty extensively in the book is how important spiritualism was to the women's movement. If not for spiritualism, we women would not probably have seen the vote as early as 1920. It probably would have taken even longer. But spiritualism was the first real movement that put women into positions of leadership and made it possible for women to go out and earn their own living. Again, we, it, it's something that it's hard for us to imagine That's in our modern interesting day. to think about. I bet a lot of people haven't thought about that. No, women women didn't hold jobs back then. I mean, your your job was to stay at home and take care of the kids and do whatever your lousy husband had to tell you to do. And this was a way out for a lot of women. Spiritualism offered them a chance to not only maybe for for widows or for unmarried women, of course, but for women who were married who wanted a way out of a lousy situation at home, they could go out and start their own career and make decent money. Now, whether or not all of them were legitimate mediums or they were just looking for a way to make some money, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously we'll never know. But the importance of it can't be underestimated as far as how it changed history. And again, that's the paranormal. It's the supernatural and its influence on all of American history. You know, it, it's it, they, they, they influenced each other. I mean, the war changed spiritualism, but spiritualism changed the lives of, of countless women and, and men around the country. So I think the two go hand in hand and people, again, don't realize the importance of it. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not the order of the ages here. I'm not going to change anyone's world with this book, but I kind of felt like it was something that I, I just, I wanted to get out there and, and, and make it entertaining. I mean, there's plenty of dissertations on this stuff out there, believe me, and they are some rough reading. But I tried to make this not dry, you know, to try to keep it as entertaining as possible, but get the point across. I kind of feel like, and this may be just because of a few books that I've read on the topic, but I kind of feel like 9-11 was another one of those, kind of a little mini boom, kind of like the Civil War did for spiritualism in the 1800s. I feel feel like 9-11 kind of brought a lot of those same things back, uh, spiritual things and, and we loved ones lost and all of that. Do you feel I that? Think you're, I think you're right about that. I think that anytime you see anything like these earth shattering events that happen in history, I mean, we had the Civil War and then um, spiritualism really died quite a bit. It wasn't if it wasn't for World War One. And in this country, we, we did see a revival after the war, but not like they did in England. And actually, this book, even though it, it's really aimed at American history, I do jump back and forth across the pond a few times because you have to, because the movement of things. Um, for instance, the very first ghost society or ghost hunting group, uh, even though spiritualism started here in the United States, the first one was in England. 
no one thought about it here. And then eventually they it, it came back this way. So you have to go back and forth. But World War One made a big difference. But then by the 1920s, late 20s, spiritualism had mostly died and it become a niche thing. Um, and I think but I agree with you that after 9-11, we did see sort of a revival, another awakening of spiritual spiritual things, but not spiritualism. We'll never see that again. That will never come back the way that it did. That was effectively killed off in the 20s. And while there are still spiritualists out there, obviously, there are still, um, you know, some of the camps that were built up, you know, in the early 1900s, uh, at, you know, uh, Lilydale and in and, and, and Florida and Camp Chesterfield in Indiana. I mean, there are people who are still devoted to these things, but even they will tell you the seances aren't the same as they used to be. I had a, a woman who was a, is a devout spiritualist um, I had interviewed a few years ago at Camp Chesterfield, and she told me that they don't do any kind of physical you know, manifestations anymore. I mean, you're not going to see, obviously, you're not going to see ectoplasm because now we can actually test those things and know that they're not real, but you're not going to see a lot of the same. She believes that it has something to do with our diet uh, because the way that what we eat now has changed so much as it, from a, from a hundred years ago that now they're, they're not, they don't do those same kinds of things. I mean, that was her, that was her theory on it, but I did, you know, after nine 11, we, we did see a, a kind of a revert back to, you know, a uh, channeling and, and which is, I mean, it's warmed over spiritualism. A lot of our new age things are now. Uh, but I did see a, 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 an awakening in that. I agree with you. And I think that if anything like that ever happens again, we'll see that again as well. Um, so history always has an effect on this, this field, this, this thing, this thing that we do, and, and vice versa. I mean, I think that we can look back and, and, and see that that's been proven over time. You have a lot to say about a duo known as the Davenport Brothers. And mm-hmm. unless I'm forgetting, I don't know that I've read about them anywhere else. Who were the Davenport brothers? Well, you do find some things about them, um, but they're just, they were not, the the funny thing about them is that in their entire career, and they had a pretty long career as, and I'm going to put air quotes around the word mediums, because they never once claimed to be mediums. They never said they were anything. Um, they just came, put on a performance let people think whatever they wanted to and went home. So a lot of people have looked at that and said, well, these guys were obviously just great magicians, you know, they, and since they never claimed to be mediums, they, they must've been faking the whole thing. And while other people were, were convinced that they were in contact with the spirit world, but these two brothers were just, they were a couple of young guys who their, their backstory is a bit, it's a bit odd because it, it's possibly somewhat invented uh, but there were stories about how when they were very young that their father sold them to a sideshow circuit. And then they would go out and they would always escape from whatever they were in and cause spiritualist type events to happen. And, and I say that because that's what they said. They never claimed anything. Uh, but they would be locked up normally in a cabinet. They invented, I guess you would call the spirit cabinet, which was this giant wooden box that they that traveled with them wherever they went and there would be a, an open space in the middle and then the brothers would sit on these two benches at either end and there were doors on the cabinet they would be placed inside the cabinet tied up by usually volunteers who were part of the audience and i mean a lot of those volunteers were university professors doctors i mean they they performed for just about anybody they would be locked up inside this cabinet tied up and as soon as the doors would close, musical instruments inside the cabinet would start flying around and playing. Uh, guitars would play, tambourines would shake, bells would ring, hands like that were allegedly spirit hands. You know, I am sitting here acting this out, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> as I'm talking to you, I'm waving it's my hands around. It's too bad we're not like, a video oh show. Yeah, I know it. I know. <laughs> I'm waving my hands around. Anyway, I, I just realized I was doing it. Um, Anyway, th- these hands would appear in the doorway, like these holes in the doorway that allegedly were not the hands of the Davenport brothers. And then a volunteer would open the doors and they would still be inside tied up. Or, you know, a volunteer would be put inside the cabinet with them and holding on to them and would swear they remained tied. 
and would often feel, even though it was pitch dark, would feel these hands touch them all over the head and, you know, bells would ring in their face and this kind of stuff. And sometimes the musical instruments, according to some of the reports, would actually fly out of the cabinet, out of the holes in the cabinet. And levitate above the heads of the sitters, play guitars, whack people on the head, all kinds of stuff. And there were, and I'm being literal about this, hundreds of people who witnessed their seances in this country and in England and swore they were genuine, swore that these things were really happening and they were caused by ghosts. Um, There was only one magician who had... Uh, disputed and claimed that he could imitate them. And he did put on a show where he imitated some of their stunts, but not all. And so, and then he sort of faded away when the Davenport brothers, they had about a, I mean, they toured all over Europe. They toured around this country and had about a, I believe like a 40 year career and never wow. once were they exposed as frauds. No one, I mean, people would claim they were frauds, of course, kind of like the way it works today. You know, these people are out there going, oh, well, that's not none of that's real, even though they've never been there, never seen it, don't know anything about the details. And because they just their minds refuse to allow them to accept the possibility that there might be something to it, um, would claim the Davenport brothers were frauds, but could never prove it. And eventually they just retired. Now, I, I will say that there were several later magicians like Harry Keller, who said that he had interned with the Davenports and knew, learned their tricks but maybe he did, maybe they didn't, but nobody ever exposed them as fakes. And neither brother ever said that, you know, this, this isn't real. Um, they eventually they, one of them died, William died fairly young and was uh, buried in Australia. Uh, his brother eventually retired. He lived quite a while longer, but he didn't perform again without, without William. It, it's a, it's a weird story. It's a really, I found it a really intriguing story. And I, I kind of put that in the chapter with Daniel Hume and the Eddie brothers of people that, what do you say? I, we can't, we can't know that they were fakes I and mean, they were never exposed as fakes. It can't be proven that they were frauds. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but there are a lot of unsolved mysteries when it comes to spiritualism. I mean, we can't, you know, you can look at, everybody wants to trot out pictures of the really phony ectoplasm with the face cut out faces from magazines glued in it and, and, and trot that out and go, Oh, look, obviously this was all fake. The problem is, is that the good stuff, there aren't any photographs of because no one could do it. It all happened so fast. It, you know, photography wasn't set up for right. these unexplained events back then. You know, when, um, when Henry Alcott did this, lengthy investigation of the Eddie brothers. I mean, this was a guy who was, um, uh, he went on to form theosophical movement with uh, Madame Blavatsky. But prior to that, he had been an investigator during the Civil War, rooting out fraud. That's what he did for, for a living during the war. He served and exposed and arrested hundreds of people who were, you know, defrauding the government on contracts during the Civil War. And when it was over, he was working at a newspaper. He was a writer. And got intrigued, had no interest in spiritualism, but got intrigued by the stories of the Eddie brothers, these two cranky, mean, nasty guys who were not profiting from their spiritualistic movement, other than they had an inn that they ran because they had to put some, the the people who came to see their seances had to put them somewhere. And they never profited from it, really. They didn't even like each other. They didn't like other people, but they would perform these seances. And Colonel Alcott spent a month there trying to expose them as fakes and couldn't do it. Um, these were guys who would go in, one of them would go into a, a, a draped off spirit cabinet. And over the course of an hour long seance, about a hundred people would come out of the cabinet in every kind of costume from around the world, clothing, speaking different languages, wearing clothing, not produced in the United States, would walk out of a cabinet, which he checked for trap doors, secret passages, anything yet they would walk out, talk to the people at the seance, and disappear. He couldn't, it so changed his life that he went from being like this, you know, hardened investigator and attorney into starting a spiritual movement that still exists today. That's how much it changed his world, seeing this stuff happen that he couldn't explain. How do you explain that? I mean, how do you just blow that off? You can't. I mean, it changed history. I think sometimes we we assume that people a hundred years before us 
were, were, stupid. were co- completely ignorant and, and don't know how to use their brain. Right. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Well, it's old. Oh, it happened in the 1870s. So I'm sure they were mistaken. Really? But yet you can you can take a plan by plan, you know, a blueprint of every single ha- thing that happened that someone wrote about during a battle during the Civil War. But you can't accept the fact that a, a guy with just as much credibility went to a farm in Vermont and saw ghosts. Well, he must be mistaken because it was the 1870s. You know, that's that's the kind of mindset that so many people have and don't realize. You know, they look back at this stuff and go, "Oh, well, it's old. We can't take it seriously." But we have to take it seriously. I mean, it, it's it created what we do. Can I assume you're holding Harry Price responsible for the model of what we know as the paranormal investigator today? I do. Um, I do that for several reasons. Mostly because I think he got a raw deal at the time uh, from a lot of people who were, um, you know, and I detail a lot of the scientific, and again, I'm going to put that in air quotes, investigations going on in the late 19th century and early 20th century. I I pick out a lot of those cases from people who should have known better. I mean, things they should have known better that they got fooled on. Um, so, we, you know, so William Crooks is a great example of you know, here was a guy conducting this almost year long investigation of a young woman who uh, was a medium who claimed that, you know, she could cause this other spirit to manifest. This Katie, Katie King would come out and they looked exactly alike, wearing different clothing. And somehow this eminent scientist never photographed the two of them together. <laughs> You know, I mean, there were these things that you're thinking, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, what, what are you doing here? And um, Harry Price got tired of sitting around in seance rooms going over the same thing over and over and over again and went looking for haunted houses. Now, did he get involved in some silly stuff for publicity? Absolutely. But he had to because I, I look at Harry Price as a guy who knew that the only way that the general public could become interested in Ghosts and the paranormal, because again, remember, people were were fascinated by spiritualism, but they weren't fascinated with investigations. They didn't care that people just there was just no it wasn't like now people were interested in ghost hunters and that kind of thing. Well, they're interested because, well, thanks to Harry Price, because he knew that in order for people to get interested, the general public, it had to be entertaining. And he wanted to entertain people, but he also wanted to find legitimate evidence, but he knew it had to be fun for in order for people to care. So here was a guy who went and rented a house for a year, the Borley Rectory, rented it for a year and put in a 24-hour day, pretty close anyway, 24-hour day revolving group of ghost hunters. The general public, he didn't tell them what to do. He didn't tell, he didn't hang over their shoulder. He gave them a booklet and said, you know, here's some hints and tips. Bring whatever equipment you like, just write it all down. That's all he wanted them to do. And, you know, it, it set his ghost hunting kit, his ghost hunter's book, his methods set an example that, that people are still using today. They just don't know it. I mean, if you, if you went into a room at the conference, well, that might be bad because I've been force feeding Harry Price down people's throats for years at the conference. <laughs> but um, go into a group of ghost hunters, you know, anyone say, you know, 35 and under, and ask them who Harry Price was, I can guarantee you that 80% of them would have no idea who he was. But then ask them what they do when they go to a ghost hunt or during an investigation, and I can get out one of Harry Price's books and go tick, tick, tick down the list. They're still doing it. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I had to put him in this book, even though he was British and he was England's favorite ghost hunter. I had to put him in the book because his methods spread across the Atlantic, and we're still using them. And I think he is one of the most important figures in modern ghost hunting. There's there's just no question about it. I remember reading about some of his tech and like <laughs> ways he would do like photography and and the descriptions. And I remember going, oh, my God, I am lost with just the technology reading about it from then. You know, like it, it I would never have guessed that the uh, gosh even like the chemicals that he would use and the yeah. uh, that's like crazy stuff for then <laughs> right oh yeah absolutely yeah he was ahead of his time yeah I, and i know exactly what you're talking about not only not only the chemicals he used to you know develop photographs and stuff but he had a powder that had been 
electromagnetized so that if he spread it on the floor, not only would it leave footprints like a motion detector we would use now, not only would it leave footprints, but the the, the particles would magnetize themselves to whoever was was using it or had walked through it. So if it was a fraud, you know, your hoaxer would have these these this powder magnetized to their shoes. And if it was really a ghost, well, you might be able to track the ghost. That was his thinking. And I mean, man, talk about ahead of your time. You know, this was the 1930s, you know, and he's doing this stuff. And now, you know, now, you know, people are using apps on their smartphone, you know, and thinking that's telling them something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so it's it's all it's really I mean, he it's a, he's an interesting figure. And um, I think that doesn't get all of the in, at least in this country and in England, he's he's kind of got this love him or hate him kind of feel with him. I, I've talked to a lot of friends, you know, who lived in England over the years, and they're like, "Why do you care about Harry Price?" And I'm like, "Well, you don't understand, you know." And they do understand, but they just don't feel the same way that I do. But it's you know, it's a whole different kind of field over there than it is here. I mean, they're investigating when they go to an old house over there; it's a thousand years old. Here, it's a hundred years old. It's just not, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a whole different kind of thing. He also had some really simple techniques that I think we need to get back to. Like, duh, if something scoots across the room, why don't you circle the table legs uh-huh. on the ground so that you know if it's been moved again? You right, know, right. Things exactly. like that. I'm like, exactly. shut up. Why aren't Common we doing sense. that? I know. Common sense stuff. And really, that was the first time. And, and I've started to notice it kind of coming back again, but I noticed it really in his in his writings when he started talking about trigger object, objects you mm-hmm. know uh, that could be used and that's something that is starting to come back it, it it kind of went up in popularity again for a while in the 90s and then people sort of forgot about it with all the new technology people let it go but i'm starting to hear that again that people are talking about objects again that are tied to the house or or tied to the time period that they believe that the the ghost is you know has manifested from you know it's a a toy from you know the early 1900s or and again like you said just make a darn circle on it so that you know if it moved you know it's it's not this stuff isn't isn't hard it's it's common sense but it seems like we've sort of forgotten about some of that stuff because we have so many new gadgets you know that we that no one had in the 30s we forget that some of that stuff was invented for a reason, and, and why aren't we using it? Why aren't we still doing it? So I agree with you. Is there a character or a fascinating story that was unknown to you that you discovered while writing this book? Um, gosh, you know, that's a, that's a good question because there, there, a, lot of the, a lot of the names, you know, I knew. But, you know, it was funny. I, I can tell you one thing that, that my opinion changed about. For whatever reason, a lot of the early material that I had ever had about Daniel Hume was that he was this horrific, arrogant, you know, mean, money grubbing, you know, and and all these things that I had heard about him. And for whatever reason, I I decided to really look at him, take another look at Daniel Hume because he's such an odd character and found that not only was he not arrogant, I found out where the source of it came from. It came from some of the other spiritualist mediums that he dismissed at the time and said, oh, you know, that that's not real. And so they wrote horrible things about him. And somehow, you know, over time, writers rewrite other writers or they find, use them as source material. And somewhere over time, that sort of bled into everything and, and said, you know, this guy was, was this tuberculosis ridden, kind of sad young individual who never really knew his parents had lived with an aunt and and got into this really because he he the only other work he knew and what he really wanted to do was be on stage he wanted to be an orator which there's a career that you know we don't have anymore but he want that's what he wanted to do he wanted to recite poetry and tell stories and instead found that he had these 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 gifts and decided to put them into use. He he was never, and you can often say he was never paid for his seances. And I, I do kind of take exception to that because while he wasn't paid, he was he was kept by a series of wealthy individuals who he performed for on command and rich widows. Um, they would kind of pay his way along. 
But I think what's so intriguing about him is, is, as I've already mentioned, is the fact that when he performed a seance, it wasn't done with all the theatrical trappings that would come along later. You know, you didn't have the the eerie low lit seance room and the spooky music and the, you know, the, the medium at the end of the table imploring everyone to hold hands. He would walk into a brightly lit room and stuff happened. I mean, everybody from, you know, just the guy off the street to the, you know, the czar of Russia claimed that he saw the things that Hume did. And it really did. I I had always sort of dismissed him as this kind of you know, well, maybe he did some stuff that nobody could really explain, but, you know, he was probably a con artist. And my my opinions about him changed. And that, I think, was a big thing with this book. And I also had written a number of times about Henry Alcott, who I've already mentioned to you, who investigated the Eddie brothers. But I decided to delve a little deeper into his life outside of being just the investigator of the Eddie brothers and really saw how you know, spiritualism rocked his world. I mean, this guy did a complete about face and his life was entirely changed because of a, of a couple of weeks on this farm. And uh, that impressed me. It impressed me a lot. It it really did. And, um, I, I started writing about some, like, as I mentioned, I wrote about some things in this book that I really hadn't written about too much before getting into more of the modern era because I didn't feel like that I I really covered it and really no one has. And it was tough getting some of this stuff together and and looking at what happened in the United States as far as the paranormal went prior to, you know, the 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 big change in the 70s when Amityville came along and just captured the imagination of the country. And what I'll tell you is not 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 much. <laughs> not much. Mm-hmm. It was such a side note because people wanted to talk about past lives and reincarnation and Edgar Casey and UFOs. Uh, that all dominated our culture, you know, for at least as far as the paranormal went for decades. Um, it wasn't until the 70s that we really started to see things swing around again. And um, and you, of course, you blame that all on a case that spiraled out of control as a, you know, a blatant, crazy hoax that no one knew how to stop. And I think I had the most fun writing that chapter of the book because people don't realize what a runaway train that thing was. And really, there's so much blame to be spread around for that that you can't really blame anyone in particular uh, because it just it just got out of hand. It just did. And it's still out of hand. And I think that's what scares me about it to this day is that, it, again, it's kind of like if you took a room full of people and ask who Harry Price was, 80% of them wouldn't know. And if you take a room full of people and ask them if they believe the Amityville horror was true, unfortunately, a, a good more than half of them would say, oh, yeah, that's scary. That's a haunted house. You know, and uh, that that it makes me want to take a wooden door and beat my head against it <laughs> until I can no longer think. But, you know, <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of it. I mean, it is all part of our, our history and our and our popular culture. But some of it is is scarier than others, and I don't mean scary in a good way. I think people with the Amityville store story, I think people are missing the the true, I guess, fascinating part about it, and that is just the original events that happened there. Exactly. The murders and what was going on in uh, the, the DeFeo child's head to go to do that, and then... To me, also in my brain, I have well, clearly all of the Amityville story, you know, after that is you know hoax or made up or whatever. But what could be there? Well, the th- the thing about it is, and I and I and I really strongly feel this that this house certainly had the potential to be haunted. It's kind of like the the Myrtle's plantation story. Nothing about Chloe. None of that is true. Mm-hmm. It's all absolutely a lie, and they know it's a lie. But there were at least 10 recorded deaths in the house. All of them were bad. Uh, There was someone shot to death. And Amityville is the same way. Here is a guy who wiped out his entire family in 15 minutes. And this house certainly had the potential to be haunted. And I think it may have been. I think there could have been some things that did happen in that house, but were so blown out of proportion that anything that did truly happen has been lost, completely lost. Um, I don't think that whatever it was continued Obviously, based on everyone who's lived in the house since then and have 
experienced absolutely nothing other than annoying sightseers, I really think that there could have been something that happened to the Lutzes, something minor, something residual, you know, that they made a note of and said, oh, you know, this is weird, you know, and then it got into the hands of people who decided to spin it into what it became. And, you know, that's why I say there's there's so much blame to go around in the story that you can't say, oh, it's, you know, it was all the Warren's fault. Oh, it was all Hans Holzer's fault. Oh, it was all the attorney's fault. No, it was Jay Anson, the writer. You can't, you know, it, it all came from somewhere, you know, and, and once you threw it into that mixing pot, it just, it just went berserk. And I don't, I don't know how many ways you can explain that creepy photo it is still super creepy of the it is. the child you know that will what they assume to be the child but you know they've kind of explained that away it is creepy it's still a creepy picture yeah <laughs> absolutely you know i and i've seen plenty of pictures that have turned out to be nothing that are still creepy and and that one definitely definitely fits the bill that yeah. is for sure yeah <laughs> So, again, we're talking to Troy Taylor about his book, American Hauntings, The Rise of the Spirit World and the Birth of the Modern Ghost Hunter. The cover is amazing. It's almost 400 pages. And truth be told, I just got the book yesterday and I've been digging into it and I can't wait. Just talking about it has gotten me going. And so (laughs) I can't wait to really sit down and read every bit of it. So, Troy, tell us where people should go to get that book. Well, it's, I mean, it's available on Amazon and that kind of thing too. Um, if you get it from us, you get it autographed. So if you go to uh, the Prairie Ghost website or our new website, which is American Hauntings Inc., Inc. like the ink well, I may not have thought that through completely, but <laughs> AmericanHauntingsInc.com you can get the books from there and they, they always go out autographed. So, but otherwise, I mean, you could go to Amazon or, or wherever Barnes and Noble and pick it up, but I am, am proud of the book. Um, but you know, it's, it's, as you know, uh, this is book number one twenty one. So, and I'm already on to two other projects. So, you know, you, you write a I, book about every two days. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm on to something else now. Um, and so it's just kind of one of those things where, People ask me something, and I'll go, oh, yeah, 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 I'd love that, you know? So, but this is stuff that's, is, I mean, I've got a few of my books that somebody asked me, and I'll go, is that in my book? Um, because it was <laughs> 10 years ago. This one I think I'll remember because this is stuff that I have been fascinated with my entire life. And this is a book that I really wanted to put together. And this wasn't the original title of it. It, it just, uh, last fall, I put out one called Ghosts of the Prairie. And It was fun because that was, you know, that was the original name of, I used to do a, well, it was the nineties. So I did a a zine back then, uh, that it was a ghost magazine called ghost of the prairie. And it went on for, for quite a few years and, and it was always fun. And I, friends show up sometimes and they'll have old issues and I've got a big pile of them too. And, and it was just kind of cool. And it was, since it was a, that was a book about central Illinois and that was where I grew up and that was the name of the magazine. That's what I named it. So a friend of mine said, well, why, you know, why don't you, because the name, the, the actual title I had was this was very complicated. And with this lengthy subtitle, it really got complicated. And they said, why don't you just call it what you do? And I'm like, oh yeah, American Hauntings, that works. So <laughs> that's how we ended up with the title. And then, you know, and then of course I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Britain here. So pardon me for this, you know, this side trip, but here we go. So, you know, I had to go back and forth because it was all so influenced on each other. But yeah, I, I really did. I, I'm really happy with this book. And um, it's one that, that I think that I'll continue to be happy with for a long time. Well, good. I'm excited. I'll be heading toward the uh, Alton, Illinois area this summer for the Haunted America Conference. And I know there are going to be some other Paranerd friends that are listening right now that are going. And uh, by the way, let me know if you're going to be there. But tell us what's coming up for the conference this summer. What What are some of the big highlights? Well, I uh, I was... Again, it was it was one of those things that I was really excited about for the conference this year because when last year we were kind of like, okay, well, how do we? It was our 20th anniversary, and you know, Lisa and I felt like we really pulled out all the stops and you know and things. And I'm thinking, okay, so now what are we going to do? You know, <laughs> you know how so, do we top but it? But within like you know within like a week of last year's conference, we'd already pretty much planned this one. Um, that's how it always goes. And believe it or not, I've already got most of 
the 2018 conference already planned because wow. well you can't you can't have everybody that you want to have i mean you want to have there you know you have certain people that you haven't that you want to have back then there are people that you want to have that you haven't had there before and then you find that i just ran out of space you know um because what we try to do with the conference and what i've always tried to do with the conference is to not have it be just a bunch of people you know, and say, oh, I've got 50 celebrity guests and you're not going to hear from any of them unless you go stop at their table. We don't, you know, you know, we don't do that with our conversation. I, I, I want people to, to be able to present their topic and their idea and that kind of thing. And so you, you, you have to limit the number of speakers that you can have. And so I always want people that for the next time that we didn't have this time. So um, I do, and we, we do have a couple of people back. I mean, Rosemary Guiley is, she's been kind of a standard at the conference for years and, um, she's coming back and Sarah Soderlin's coming back and we've had some of our other speakers are doing workshops. So that's, that's the next best thing. If I didn't have a spot for Sherry break on the, you know, on the roster, uh, I had a spot for her as a workshop. So it's, she still gets to be there. But this year I actually went out and did what I don't normally do and sought out a couple of friends that that have been from TV shows and I don't normally do that just because and it's nothing against them but my past experience has been not these two guys but my past experience has been with a lot of the TV people is that they do best in a convention with 50 different guests where they can sit at a table and sign headshots and they shouldn't actually talk to anyone because then people find out they don't really know anything and that's <laughs> I don't oh my want gosh, that interesting. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. And so when I do have people who have done TV, I try to pick people that I know have something to say. You know, um, Chris Fleming um, has done quite a few shows, but I've known Chris since like the mid 90s. And I know what Chris has to say. And I know that he's got very cool things to say. And we had him at a Dead of Winter event uh, a year or two ago. And um, people just loved him. And he's such a great guy. He's one of the nicest really one of the genuinely nicest people I know. And so I was really happy to have him back. And Rob Demarest, who did Ghost Hunters International. And if you follow, if you follow Rob, he comes across as like this cranky, <laughs> you know, you know, just, uh, but he, a very inspirational guy on one hand. And the next time he's like, ah, I hate this, you know. Uh, but he, again, is one of those guys that is probably one of the I mean, again, genuinely, I think he's a really nice guy. He's super, super knowledgeable. And uh, I just think he's one of the coolest guys I know. And, you know, the fact that, you know, I just said, hey, man, would you do this? And he said, all you had to do is ask. And here he is. I I'm excited to have him. And I think people will really enjoy him at the conference. And, um, you know, we added workshops this year. We added ghost hunts this year. So every year is going to get bigger and better, I hope. But this is always every year is going to be the biggest and best so far. So you don't want to miss it. You know, you, you still you got to come because this is going to be even bigger than last year, you know, and then next year, bigger yet. But I just I tell people, man, just and we do. And I and I say that and I, I joke. But, and we you know, we, we if you have 300 people there, 150 of them have come 10 years in a row, you know, or more. Um, people come back every year just to see what we're going to be doing next. and. I got to tell you, I, I love the conference because it, I mean, it, I, I don't leave my lair that often to do things. I mean, I, I like to go out and do, you know, weekend events and that kind of thing, but I don't do it a lot. I don't do a lot of conferences and stuff. Um, when I do them, it's because I've had so much fun there in the past that I want to go back. But getting out and coming to the conference and seeing people at the conference that I do not, I only get to see them once a year. You know, I mean, a lot of the people I are, I see often and which I love, but some of the people that's the only time I'm going to see them because they're coming from California or New York or, you know, Texas or somewhere far away. And the fact that I get to see them at the conference, it makes the weekend go just too darn fast. You know, it just does. The whole thing goes by in a blur. You know, we build we wait for this thing all year and then it's gone in no time because we have so much fun. I mean, it is just, it's a fun event and, you know, it's people, you, you learn things, you get excited about stuff. And I think that every year after I leave the conference, I think I am more excited about the supernatural and the paranormal and what I'm going to do next. I leave there more excited every single year. 
And that's it really is it is really the hot one of the highlights of my year. And for somebody who's not like us, a, a paranerd or doesn't live for this stuff, they don't understand that. They're like, you do what? You're going to sit in a hotel and listen to people talk about ghosts all weekend. That's the highlight of your year. Yep. <laughs> yep, it sure is. Mm-hmm. It sure is. I roll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we talked about this last time, but before I had been to this conference last summer, my whole concept of a conference was was a, a music teacher conference. I've been to tons of right. different kinds of music education conferences, and so that's what I had in my head, and I wasn't exactly sure what to expect. I was, you know, imagining like the different comic cons or, you know, trying to figure out what it would be like. And when I got there, I immediately, you know, and I had a microphone with me and kind of put it in a few people's faces and we talked, but I immediately (laughs) noticed this sense of community that I thought was cool. Just like you were, you were talking about. And there's the, I'm going to forget her name and I'm feeling really bad, but there's the woman who I talked to, totally blew blew me away who and you even uh mentioned her i think in the keynote the that has been there every single year since the barb heiser barb heiser Heiser. i look forward to it every year this is this is my vacation yeah all weird all the time (laughs) and i'm sure you've met some friends that you wouldn't have met without coming to these conferences Oh, sure. Renee and a a bunch of the other guys, Len, we may not see each other except for the once a year when we come to the conference. So you're kind of a celebrity here, I guess. (laughs) Know everyone? (laughs) Well, I know know a few people. Yeah. And I've presented a couple of times. Yeah. Um, So, yes. Yeah, I have a good time. Any experiences that stick out from 20 years? Well, there was um, the year... Back when we were at the History and Hauntings bookstore, there was one one weekend conference where the ghost at the bookstore was throwing books off the shelves. Oh my god! One of which landed on my head, you know, and so that was pretty good. the The things I remember most, though, are especially back in the early days. This was the place that we came to find out what was going on with technology, the internet was not available. There was no such thing as YouTube. And so the first time any of us saw video that had been taken with night shot technology Mm, was here. You know, the first time uh, Renee was working with a family that had poltergeist activity, she showed the video where she caught the son of the family faking it. Mm. You know, so... There were all kinds of things that this was the place that we came to learn how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The first time I ever um, saw a ghost box operated was here. You know, so it, it is a bit less of that now simply because YouTube is out there and, and there's just so much more information available via the Internet. But in terms of actually getting together with people who are investigating and just spending time swapping stories. Oh, yeah. Because there's things you don't necessarily tell the civilian population <laughs> on a YouTube video. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this this is really a very special networking event, too. Yeah. I'm honored to meet you. This is oh, very cool. I'm and this pleased. is Barb, by the way. I didn't say your name. I'm so. Barb Heiser of Monmouth, Illinois founder and lead investigator and paranormal social worker for the small town ghosts team well thank you thank you and just to get the chance to talk to her for like the five six minutes that i talked to her was totally worth the whole convention yeah, well, but Barb is amazing anyway. I mean, just down flat. I mean, I, I've known Barb. She has been coming to the conference ever since we started. But, I mean, she goes back to the, the 60s and 70s with investigating. I mean, she's done it. Uh, it's probably, for people I know personally, has been doing it longer than anyone else I know. Uh, but I think, she's, I think she's right. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is a highlight of my year, because this is several hundred people that you can talk to and not, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's some, you know, some crazy stuff comes up no matter where you are or what you're doing. 
but this is the one place that I can always feel like that you can talk to just about anybody about anything to do with the paranormal and you're, you're not, you don't feel like you're crazy. You know, it's, I mean, I can't, I can't go to a book signing and do a book signing somewhere without half the people walking by going, what is that? You know, yeah, that doesn't happen at the conference because we're all there for the same, for the same reason. And uh, it is a community. It really is. And um, it's a place, it's a, it's a safe place. How's that for a, how's that for a word? It's a safe place for everybody who is interested in the paranormal, you know? So it's fun. I, I, I do love it. And I, uh, I, I really look forward to it. And gosh, it's, you know, at the time we're recording this, what is it? Six, five, six weeks away, be here before we know it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm ready. And there's, there's plenty of tickets available and all that stuff. Tell people how they do that. We do still have tickets available. Um, if you go to americanspookshows.com, uh, we do have tickets available for general attendance. Um, a lot of our after-hour events are either – several are full, uh, several are getting close. So if you're wanting to do one of the ghost hunts or workshops or something, that you probably should, should get on that. Um, there's still some time to get general admission tickets. Uh, we are about three-quarters full, so we, we still have some space left. Um, but I will say that the the conference discount rooms at the hotel where we have the event, that ends on the 23rd of May. So um, we will not have discount rooms anymore after that time. And about the 15th of May, we or I guess the 23rd, we'll cut off T-shirt orders for this year, too. So if you want a souvenir shirt, and um, I don't know if you remember last year at the conference, we had the 20th anniversary, and Lisa had had gotten a bunch of people to donate old shirts to make that quilt, you know, to make a big shirt quilt for me for the anniversary. Um, people keep those shirts. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they, yeah, I mean, they, they go back all the way to the beginning. So it's kind of one of those things that collectors love to items. Have the, yeah. They have the souvenir because once we do it once, we'll never do it again kind of thing. And, uh, but that'll end on the 23rd as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. So again, this is on June 23rd and June 24th, the haunted America conference. Well, sir, any final thoughts? No, I think that, I, well, other than I appreciate you having me on and let me ramble because I can, I'm going to tell everybody what we were talking about during the break is that if you just wind me up and let me go and don't stop me, I will just keep talking all day. So you have to stop me at some point. So <laughs> I appreciate you letting me, letting me do this and talk about things and, and, and every guest that you have on, you know, getting people on here to do this show, which I think honestly and this is not just me blowing smoke because we're sitting here talking, but this is my favorite paranormal podcast. Oh. You have it. You're, no, really. It is the one that I always listen to every time I, a new episode pops up. And the fact that we have an outlet like this where we can get on with someone who really is passionate about what we're doing and wants to hear about it like you are. And I'm always going to point, if you are new to this podcast, go look up Patrick's interview with Guy Playfair about The Conjuring. I'm telling you, the passion that you put into that particular episode really, really impressed me. And uh, it gave him what the do the do that he deserved. I mean, other people, you know, got on to the whole thing after the movie came out, but nobody did it the way that you did. I mean, it was obvious you'd read the book, you knew the story, and you let him present it the way he needed to present it and, and tell the truth about the story. And um, that has impressed me ever since. And I tell people all the time, I recommend your podcast. And the reason I do it is because you're, you're giving everyone an outlet for the things that they do and the passion of the things that they love and you love. And uh, this is a great source. It's a great outlet for it. And uh, man, I, I just, I want this show to continue for as long as you feel like doing it. That's for sure. Man, I appreciate it. You, you rock for that. Thank you. <laughs> well, and I mean it. I mean every word. And I do like to just let people go because I usually have no life, as I said. And, um, you know, I just let people get out what they need to get out. And we could always do a part two or three or four. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. As Good long point. as they have the time, why <laughs> should I shut people yeah. up? Good point. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. You rock. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I will see you uh, next month at the conference. Yeah. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. 
You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time.